Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the Innovate Ag Smart Orchard Series. I'm Steve Mansell, founder and CEO of Innovate Ag, and we are so glad to have with us today uh, Colin Campbell with Meter Group and Dave Brown with uh, Ag Director of the Washington State University based Ag WeatherNet. And today, what we're going to walk you through is uh, a little bit about the Smart Orchard project that we've been doing with Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission and Washington State University. Um, and one of the key sets of um, telemetry and equipment that we have out in the Smart Orchard is gear from Meter Group. And so uh, Dr. Campbell is going to talk us through some of what's happening with their Atmos series equipment. And then Dave will bring it together as to some of what the findings are and how you can bring your orchard or vineyard online onto the Ag WeatherNet um, network as a tier three station. Um, quick background on Innovate Ag. Um, our focus really is empowering growers with data. And what we found in talking to growers is that they have many, many different data sources that you have to deal with uh, in your day to day. One grower told us that they have as many as 19 different apps on their phone that they look at for different weather sources, for payroll, uh, for spray recommendations and so on. And what Innovate Ag seeks to do is really consolidate those data from all those different data sources to simplify your approach to management, but also um, to enable you a little bit more around data portability so that you can have all of that data in one place so that as you make changes on your different data sources and data providers over time, you still have access to all of that um, um, as, as you mature um, in what your approach is on um, the data-led decision-making. Um, our focus predominantly is on permanent crops with an emphasis on apples. We are starting to stick our toe in on the vineyard side of things, uh, nuts. And um, as you can see over on the right-hand side, our approach is very focused on working in collaboration with land-grant universities um, and bringing together a tight feedback loop on the different models, um, disease models, crop management guidance, pest management guidance um, that's being done in this case, largely with Washington State University. Um, so with that said, uh, I will hand it off to Dr. Colin Campbell to speak about Meter Group. Thanks, Steve. It's great to, to get together here and talk about some of my favorite subjects. Make, making measurements is something that that I'm a I'm a sucker for always joining the conversation. So, um, I want to first talk about measurements and the vital connection between making great measurements, making high quality measurements, and some things that that are critical to what we need, uh, like yield. And I saw there, Steve, in your picture, you did have potatoes there. You didn't mention it, but I want to want to say that that this these data are from a potato field. Been working with a grower for the last few years and and doing various projects related to weather and also soil. And you can see that that one of the interesting things that came out of this project was that that there is a relationship between in field soil water tension measurements and yield loss. Something he had no idea about until we actually went out in the field. And and made made measurements, and so the the connection between measurements and, and knowledge that we we need to manage is an important one in my opinion. So I've I've made a couple of statements here. One, data are at the heart of decision making, and two, accurate, reliable sensors are required for actionable data. And so I I want to talk about this as is kind of the, the foundation of, of exactly um, what I'm going to talk about through the rest of the, the, the discussion. And so I wanted to start there. Let's see, am I controlling this? There we go. Yeah, it was given, give me the, the, no, I'm not doing it, but we're, we're there. I want to introduce just a little bit about Meter Group. But first I want to talk about a life experience that almost all of us here, maybe all of us have had which is going out and buying a new car, new to us anyway. 
And when we go out and do it, rarely are we, when we go out there thinking, well, I'm going to buy the very best car there is. Let's say, I don't know, this is old, but the Bugatti Veyron, you know, everything involved. Or I'm going to go out and buy the absolute cheapest car I can possibly get, um, the, the, uh, the Yugo. Maybe that's too old a reference. Maybe the, the Menindra SUV or something is a, is a more modern reference. Um, and so, so these two, you know, between these two extremes that we typically don't work at, we are looking at, at, at the best thing we can get for the most affordable cost. And we usually take in a lot of things like, hey, I need it to tow a certain amount or I want it to be comfortable. I want it to be entirely reliable, never break down, quote, unquote. But we often are involved in an optimization process. And this is the best way that I can describe the meter group development over the years that, that we have developed uh, for all these years. Our, our focus is to divide, develop instrumentation to provide the optimum value. And the value we, value we defined as, as this idea of performance divided by price. So we're out there thinking about things like, hey, what about accuracy? We want durability, we want usability, we want longevity, we want low maintenance. And we want a cost that's affordable and we can't take any of these things to an extreme. So we end up just trying to balance all of these things. And, and so the goal in the end is really neither the lowest price nor the maximum performance, although if any of these are certainly possible, but for the, the scientists and engineers, you know, I get to work with a lot of cool people um, every day. And, and our vision is just sitting down and saying, hey, how do we optimize th this thing? So, so when I think about it, what I just talked about as it relates to weather stations, I see a lot of extremes out there. There's a, a pretty simple objective uh, if you're a grower, in my opinion. I grew up on a farm uh, during the summers. I helped my grandpa on a dry farm in Southern Idaho. And we talked about these things. It's not Okay, we weren't irrigating, yeah, but but we had to figure out how to get the water to the to the, that was there most effectively used by the plants. And we and and when you measure things, when you try to make good decisions, you measure parameters that help you determine how to act. And with weather stations, I mean, there is a subset of people who just are kind of interested in how fast the wind's blowing right now, just for for kind of esoteric purposes. But generally, we are making decisions for the measurements, and the better the measurement the better decision that we can make. And I see these extremes like a low end weather station tend to be unreliable where parts break, they can deteriorate over time. And these pr prompt us to have to make field visits or vital sensors that we may need to estimate, let's say evapotranspiration, they're simply not there. We don't have solar radi radiation, we can't make a good, a actionable uh, ET estimate for, for our field. And things like the measurements being inaccurate or drifting over time, those just simply create headaches. If we're trying to do a thermal time analysis and we don't have an accurate measurement of thermal time, as, as Dave's gonna point out a little later in this discussion, that's a big problem. Now on the other side, sometimes we think, well, why not just do the high-end thing? We got, we got all the, we'll tighten the screws on everything and then it's gonna be okay. And I guess in that potato example I brought up earlier, he was trying to steer off a, a weather station that was located, I don't know, maybe 20 miles, 15 miles from, from, from where he was. It was the local weather station. And they gone ahead and put that weather station in a place nobody wanted to farm on a, on a black rock somewhere. And we compared the data from inside his potato field and this, this local weather station, and they didn't correlate uh, and very well. So the cost, usually means that, that these high-end weather stations only get put out for regional data. And the complexity of, even if you wanted to put one of these things in your own, uh, on your own farm, the complexity just really pushes you out of being able to do it. You've got to have someone who knows what they're doing to, to, to be able to do that. So when we were, were thinking, okay, at Meter Group, we'd really like to, to make a difference in measuring um, weather because we are a company full of scientists to, that measure the soil plant atmosphere. And our interest is to try to do that with accuracy, but with a certain amount of affordability. So we were trying to work toward a balance of these two extremes. So 
I have the Atmos 41 just pictured there. Um, there, there are a lot of resources over on the Meter Group website if you want to learn more about that. I'll put, post a, a little link in, in the chat at some point, uh, um, or we can pass it out so you can go find that if you're interested. But in this, we thought, you know, one of the biggest challenges people have is just making a field visit. Anytime you have to go to the field and fix your stuff, it costs time and it costs money. So let's make a system that doesn't have any moving parts. And let's put together a sensor suite that we'd like to have if we were making measurements. And, and so solar radiation, um, for example, often left off of, of weather station, we needed it there because we wanted to, to calculate refer, reference evapotranspiration. And then this idea of science and engineering coming together, we wanted to make something that was super simple but would have high accuracy. We didn't want to sacrifice the things that, that we needed to make good decisions. So temperature, solar radiation, wind speed, uh, extremely accurate wind speed and rainfall. These all are matching the high-end stations out there and making as good a measurement as they make. So why am I not saying this is the, the ultimate in weather stations? Well, you know, if we were going to put together the high-end weather station, we'd want to get primary standards for solar radiation. We want, may want to have a larger uh, catchment for our, our rainfall. We might want to have three-dimensional uh, uh, wind speed and a lot of these things, which we don't have here. But we're making, again, an optimization in this process. And then the last one, which was pretty funny when Steve and, and Dave and I were talking about this earlier, we, we talked about this idea that, man, let's make that setup super simple. And, and that was our plan. My, my father, who is one of the chief engineers, uh, scientists on this project, he said, I just want to be able to deploy it on a fence post and have it look like a fence post. So nobody steals it and it's super easy. And that's kind of where we got to. The other thing that, that I want to talk to just briefly is, is getting data back uh, from the field. This is called telemetry. It's simply the movement of data from sensors wherever they are to wherever we are. Uh, so we can consume it. And this is one of the most rapidly changing things in, in society today. Um, and the worst part of this problem is that that people throw names at you all the time. MBIOT, LoRa, Sigfox, Bluetooth Low Energy Mesh. All of these are coming at you. But when you think about this, the, the reality is, first of all, it's just something like how the sausage gets made. Does it really matter how the sausage gets made? If it goes from where your sensors are to where you need to consume it, does it matter how it gets there? The other thing is that, that because of all these technologies that are out there, we see a rapid price commoditization of that. There are a lot of low priced options and you're seeing this everywhere. I called my daughter the other day and she said, hey Google, turn off the light. Uh, he's like, dad, I get to turn off the light with Google. And I'm like, that's great, honey. Um, <laughs> all this work we've done over the, you know, all these years with technology and you're just turning on and off the lights. Um, but that's, what ha that's what's happening. So the question is, how is that interacting with things we need to do in terms of making measurements in the field? And that really should ask the question, why is Meter Group really in the game of, of making a data logger? Our data logger is called the ZL6. We've made a lot of interesting choices about the ZL6. We have reasons that, you know, that we do this, but, but I wanna talk specifically about why would we want to provide a solution for the field that, that could make measurements. And this is because we believe that there's more than just trying to get data from point A to point B, that, that to do that is important, but also to do that reliably so that you never have to worry about it. that is even more important. So I want you to consider a concept we call the total cost of ownership. Um, and, and the idea is that it's more than just the purchase price that goes into a cost. So when we designed, designed the ZL6, we'd already had almost 20 years of experience making field data loggers. And I tell you, we lost a pound of flesh as, as we went through some of the learning experiences. Some of the things these other com you know, commoditized radio systems will have to learn in the future, which was things like power is key. You need to make something that just never will run out of batteries, or at least certainly not in a season or a few seasons. Things like, hey, you've got to be connected to the cloud, or you've got to make sure water does not get into your electronics ever. 
And so what came out of that was this ZL6, a field hardened system. It's plug and play. So you can just go plug in your sensors. You don't need to know what to do. You plug them in, your smartphone will t let you tell how often you want to read and you're ready to get your data wherever you are. Uh, it's solar charged, so you never have to worry about charging the batteries and, and you don't have to worry about cell, cell coverage or, any, or cell um, setup. You do have to worry about cell coverage because it, it's connected by cell phone, but we've got a, most areas now where we can actually get a signal. So the, one of the things that I want to leave you with on this thought about a data logger is every, even a single trip out to manage uh, infield hardware can cost as much as your instrumentation does. So these instruments are not all that expensive when you think about it. If you have to spend time going and maintaining them, that takes away this, this price difference often. Again, back to this total cost of ownership. And so like many things in life, low cost is not necessarily the cheapest option. So let me just finish off this discussion with, with kind of what Meter Group does. Now, I, I don't have hours to tell all the fun things that, that we're working on or, or things that, that are available, but just let me finish off by saying that the ZL6 is our data logger that provides this backbone to get data back from the field. Now, there is a lot of options we, we could do, but we believe that, that an effectively priced system that simply gets data back to where you need it it seamlessly is going to be the most value to our to our customers, and then we add to that a few a lots of different sensors. A few I've mentioned here just because Dave is going to talk about them in his presentation. Mostly mentioned this Atmos 41, our all-in-one weather station. That's going to go above or outside the canopy to measure all your weather, but sometimes you want information in the canopy, and then you're going to go to the Atmos 14, which is just a relative humidity and temperature sensor. It's also got barometric pressure on it. That's gonna go down inside the canopy and probably you're gonna connect in with that a leaf wetness sensor to give you disease forecasting um, and also maybe an in-soil sensor. It's a lot of my experience actually making, making soil moisture, so water content measurements, temperature, electrical conductivity for the, the nutrients, and then a, a soil water tension, the Teros 21, which measures just the comfort range of, of the soil for the plant growth. So with that, I, I think I'm done and I'm gonna turn it over to Dave. All right, thank you, Colin. I'm going to, whoops, click the, maybe this is just trying to get a hold of the screen here. There we go. So I'll be talking about a little bit about Ag WeatherNet. And, and for those of you who aren't familiar, we now view our network as having three tiers. Tier one, we're migrating towards towers and really fairly sophisticated meteorological measurements, very high quality measurements here. Tier two, they're actually the Atmos 41 stations and that they're, again, the maintenance in particular is much, much lower than for these bigger stations, which means we can get greater coverage in the state of Washington. And there's, there's so much variability, we need that uh, to get the number of stations. Uh, and then tier three are, are private weather stations that are, these can be either private in orchard or they can also be private you know, outside somewhere else. Um, and that might particularly be the case say in Oregon and Idaho where we don't have any stations that we maintain. Um, so, but here I'm gonna talk about more about tier three as the, pri as the in orchard option. Um, and talk about our mission is really heavily emphasized on site-specific weather data and getting better data to go into all the different models available, uh, to, whether it's a pest model, whether it's a irrigation or frost, any of that, but, but how can we make that weather data as good as possible? Um, so our sources of weather data, the one that many of you are common, commonly use are the nearest Ag WeatherNet station or you know, AgriMet station or some other publicly maintained station usually. Um, what we're finding, and we've done some initial work on this, is that, you know, if you get away from the station too far, and, and in some cases too far can be one mile, in other cases maybe it's five miles, it depends on what's going on uh, topographically and some different processes, but then maybe our station doesn't represent the conditions at your site, right? And the second is gridded weather model output. There's actually a lot of providers now providing, you know, uh, they basically process what comes out of a NOAA weather model 
and say, well, if you don't have a weather station, we can interpolate and estimate what the weather is at your site. And again, uh, there are some problems with accuracy with this. Um, if, and so what we're really thinking is that particularly for high value crops, um, it's gonna be valuable to have your own station and or your own sensors. That's really the only way you can get site specific weather data. It's certainly the only way you can get in orchard conditions. And we'll talk about that in a little bit here. And lastly, you know, you might very well want to not just have weather, but soil sensors. There's ongoing work on uh, tree physiology sensors. And so those things might also be packaged into your decision making. So with that, I'm going to go on and, and talk. First of all, Dark Sky is one of several companies that provides sort of gridded weather data. Um, and, and we just did an analysis for 156 stations, roughly eight years of data. And, and we have replicate measurements at all these stations. So we know our data is pretty darn accurate. But then if you look at the comparison, you know, the, the maximum daily temperature, it's, it's, it's certainly the errors are greater than what we would expect from a weather station. This would be considered a, a poor quality weather station, but it's sort of in the ballpark. But then when we look at the nighttime temperatures, the minimums, we see just huge errors. You know, this, you know, it's not unusual at all to see a degree, an error of five degrees in either direction. We see a bias of about one degree Fahrenheit. Um, and so this, this is really for most site specific decision support, this isn't, isn't good enough. Um, now we can't evaluate every provider, but um, most of them are, are starting with the same raw material. And we'll talk a little bit later about why in particular, they struggle so much with nighttime temperatures. And this is also why a nearby ag weather net station may not represent your orchard. It's, it's the nighttime when you have problems. It's at night when, when we struggle, when things differ. And then just to show you that those errors do ripple through to growing degree errors, all right? So this is, you know, the first spray date for a coddling moth and you're looking at, you know, you can get out as far as 10, to, 10 day error, but then by the time you get to the second spray, there's a lot of them out to 10 day errors and you start to see this bias again because the low temperatures are warm biased on if you use this model data. And there, I've already seen a number of commercial operations that are offering to run all your past disease models and all kinds of things off of this kind of data. So if you hear about someone saying you don't need a weather station, don't worry, we've got some magic juju. Be very, very cautious about that. Um, let me kind of go on here. And, and this is really where it all comes together. The problem we have in Washington is that most nights, and this is particularly in the summer and, and in the shoulder seasons, um, we get inversions. If you get a clear sky and low wind, um, you get in what are called radiative inversions and it cools off at the, at the Earth's surface. And rather than the air getting colder as you go up, which is more the normal thing you expect, the air doesn't mix and you get a layer of warmer air that sort of uh, holds things in. When this happens, you also get that cold air down at the ground starts to, whoops, Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, there we go. The cold air on the ground starts to move around, starts to flow. And none of these models, none of the NOAA weather models, none of the statistical models have even incorporate these processes with, we have very, very local radiative inversions. You know, one spot has cloud cover, another spot doesn't. Different ground cover, different air movement, different, all that changes. So it's very local and it's not modeled. And that's, that's again, where we struggle, while we see a lot of difference over a short, a short distance over the ground uh, because of these radiative inversions. So with that, we're gonna talk about in orchard measurements. So this is uh, a tree fruit uh, commission funded project in orchard measurements. I, I apologize, I didn't put up their logo, but <laughs> this comes from the commission. Um, and we have a bunch of stations that are inside orchards and we are gonna do a paired comparison with the same exact station sitting outside the orchard. And what we see quite consistently from this, and I'll look over here, just focus on the temperature. And this is different kinds of canopies and so on, different kinds of irrigation. But what we see consistently is that inside an orchard, it's cooler, a couple degrees cooler on average, some more than that, some a little less. Um, it's generally, um, and by the one, the one that's less is also, we'll talk about it. This station is up on top, up above the canopy. And you'll see that when you go down in the canopy, there's a difference. Obviously relative humidity tends to be a lot higher, except if your cooling comes from netting instead of from evaporative cooling, then you don't get that boost in relative humidity. So you, a lot of this is from the evaporative cooling. This is, a lot of this is from evaporative cooling and obviously much less wind. 
So that, that, and this wind difference we're gonna argue is one of the bigger effects. And the reason is this. So this is showing you the diurnal pattern over several months inside versus outside the orchard. And what I wanna highlight here is that we see some of the biggest differences in temperature inside and outside at night. When there is no irrigation, this is not an irrigation effect. We see it here, we see it here. Quincy, this is netting. There's no evaporative cooling at all. There's a big difference at night, inside versus out. Big difference inside versus out. So we're, what we're seeing, and we have some other measurements I'm not gonna go into that suggest to us that the lower wind speed means you get an enhanced inversion. It's, remember, if a low wind speed means a stronger inversion, that the canopy is stopping the air from moving, it's stopping it from mixing, you still, because the canopy is open, you still get the radiation going out, you're losing heat, and it gets really cold inside these orchards at night. Um, so this is something we're gonna do more research on to nail down. This is from the Smart Orchard Project, and this doesn't show, we went ahead and installed two more Atmos 41s. So this is actually data from three Atmos 41s at three different heights. One is up here, one is down here, one is here. Apples to apples comparisons. Now this is showing you again, time of day. So this is, so this would be noon would be right around here. This is midnight on the right hand side here. Um, and you can see that during the heat of the day, you can see this spot right up here is where they turn on the evaporative cooling and it causes the curves to bend for the evaporative cooling, which you expect. But then look what happens overnight. It gets so much colder down inside the canopy. All right, so what we're seeing is a lot of cold air is kind of being trapped and accumulating down inside the canopy. And this is, this is a big part, and we think maybe even a bigger part than the evaporative cooling in why orchards run cooler than outside of the orchard. So, and a reason why you might wanna have a sensor in the orchard <laughs> to, to, to capture that effectively. So I just wanna briefly hit, uh, Colin talked about the 14 and the 41, and we've done some preliminary analysis of these. And, and what we're seeing is, is that, first of all, they are pretty tightly correlated, the two sensors. Um, but we do see that, and you can kind of see this on the plot a little bit, but when you get full sun on the Atmos 14, it's a passively shielded sensor and it does warm up. It can warm up a fairly normally one degree Fahrenheit, sometimes two degrees Fahrenheit. Um, again, depends on how much wind you have, but when you, if you have low wind conditions and really hot sun, uh, it will warm up. So we're recommending for the 14, put it down inside the canopy, put it on the north side of a trellis post, and we're actually gonna do some experimentation about uh, uh, constructing a little bit of shading on top of that, some additional shading that doesn't block the wind, but then uh, cuts it down even further. Because as, as long as you keep it pretty well shaded, you're gonna get weather data that pretty well matches what you would get from a 41, and that's what you want. If you expose it to sun, you're, it's gonna run warm. It's gonna be warm biased overall, particularly during the day. At nighttime, it'll be pretty spot on. The two of them run really close at night, but during the daytime, you'll see this difference, you'll see this separation. So that I just want to go on. And so again, like Colin said, we recommend for the 41s, make sure you have a clear view of the sky. Um, for the 14s, make sure you don't. <laughs> make sure they're in the shade. Um, if you're interested in adding a private station and we have the option, you can either do an Atmos 41, a full station, or you can do the 14 by itself with the logger. Um, we've got this link on the main Ag WeatherNet page provides all the instructions of how to do it. We're actually, we have another link from Meter. We haven't connected it yet. We'll be doing that, which goes straight to their page and gives you the detail and pricing. So we don't have to, people always ask us about pricing and we'd rather defer to, to Meter on that. Um, and so that'll be set up probably in the next day or so. We'll have that link activated so you can go over there and get information. So I think I'll leave off with that. So Fabulous. Go. Thank you, Dave, appreciate it. So we'll switch gears briefly to talk a little bit more on, on context on the Smart Orchard Pilot, which again, you know, huge thanks to, to the Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission for uh, their collaboration and, and funding for it in uh, 2020. And in 2021, we're expanding the Smart Orchard Pilot to include a second location. So the Smart Orchard today is just uh, north of Pasco, Washington, west of Altopia, Washington, um, at Chiawana Orchard slash Columbia Reach. And we basically have two 20 acre blocks. And you can see kind of this high level here of uh, how that 
block is set up, there's basically 100 rows or so in you know, 100 rows in each block. And you can see at the center here is where we have the um, meter group uh, Atmos 41 um, at row 40, so almost the center uh, that Dave and, uh, and Colin were showing. Um, outside um, the orchard, we actually have this meter group Atmos 41. It's, it's really actually sitting more about up here. And then we have a number of other sensors that are deployed throughout uh, our, um, our, our test orchard, basically. And that ranges from um, Agronet has uh, some in orchard temp and RH sensors. Um, we have Terralytic gear, which are uh, soil nutrient sensors, um, two of those you can see there. Uh, Phytech has some dendrometers that are deployed that are measuring the um, size of the tree trunks, as well as the um, fruit diameter uh, throughout. Um, Aquaspy has uh, soil moisture sensors uh, deployed throughout. We'll hear from Aquaspy in the coming weeks in, a, in another webinar. Um, Davis Instruments um, spoke in a webinar a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so they have their weather station there, which also allows all sorts of different um, non-Davis weather sensors um, and soil moisture sensors and radiation sensors and so on to be plugged into it as well. Um, and is there anything else I forgot? That's, that's basically kind of the summation of what we have deployed across there. And we're using a combination of um, LoRaWAN to connect these as well as conventional um, Verizon and uh, T-Mobile, uh, et cetera, uh, AT&T connectivity to, to bring these all back home. Um, so, what does that really kind of translate into for us today as we move toward an, an offering that is something that is commercially available? Well, the real world is, is this density of sensors isn't that realistic for a 20 acre orchard block. And, and the reason that we did that is partly so that you could um, have some of the takeaways that, that Dave and Colin shared with you today where we can look at inversion and look at what that looks like at a uh, nano scale, if you will. With that said, um, we have the capability to really bring together weather data, soil moisture data, nutrient data, irrigation data, uh, imagery from satellites, from uh, drone and from ATV um, and pull it all together. And, and what you saw moving down here in the bottom left-hand corner is uh, what we did with a green atlas ATV, this is actually at a neighboring uh, grower, where we ran an ATV up and down um, each orchard row at 20 miles per hour. And um, that ATV is equipped with a camera kit on the back of it and LIDAR and GPS. And ultimately you can see you're, we're capturing what the distribution looks like of apples or early in the season, apple blossoms looks like, um, as well as what the density of the trees looks like. So from that, you end up with that, this map that um, you can make informed decisions as to thinning, as to uh, perhaps as you uh, get toward later on in the season, where you do bin placement, where you do um, uh, even labor decisioning as you're looking across many 20 acre blocks, which are ones that have higher density, which have less, um, and so on and so forth. So that is really what we're rolling out in the 2020 grow 2021 growing season as an offering. We'd be happy to talk with you about that more. Um, and I'll refer to a webinar, upcoming webinar on that in a moment. Um, then we have an enhanced dashboard that we've built out um, that can pull all of this data together for select use cases. And one of those is irrigation planning. Um, and so working with Chawana Orchards, um, they can use this dashboard that's in um, a platform called Power BI. And it's accessible on a web browser, desktop, or on a mobile device. And you can ultimately look at, well, great, what does the actual ET distribution look like um, across different orchard blocks? Um, 
ultimately, how many inches of water do I need to apply? How many sets do I need to think about? Um, and helps you from an informed decision perspective on that. And then the final tier that we has, have as a premium tier is working with uh, partner Tuctronics where they have auto water capability. And so um, we've got a past webinar that talks about that and a, um, a grape grower that used that through all of last growing season where he was hands off in terms of actually controlling the pump uh, as well as the valves uh, throughout several different zones um, across his vineyard. Um, and that basically is, is looking at the soil moisture data and then working to keep the soil moisture data at around, you can set whatever it makes sense for you, but I think it was about 25% or so soil water content. I think it was 23.5% soil water content. And so uh, that's kind of a high level summation of what we're doing and what we have available. We have an app um, available that brings the data together on Google Play and on the Apple App Store um, so that you can look at that on tablets and iPhones and uh, so on and so forth. So kind of looking ahead, we've got um, plenty of resources for you. We've got an upcoming webinar this next Thursday, same time, same place. Um, that we'll be talking more in depth about Green Atlas and, and walking into uh, that. And we'd love to welcome you and your friends to that. Um, we have upcoming plans on uh, variable rate spraying with smart guided systems. If you're not familiar with them, take a look at smartapply.com. It's basically a power blast sprayer that has LIDAR and GPS on the front of it. And then on the back end, it's actuating the nozzles, uh, all 30 some odd nozzles individually at up to 10 times per second based on the tree spacing um, and, and the spaces between the trees um, as well as the, the height. And so we've seen some growers have seen as much as 50% savings on chemical application uh, as a result of taking that variable rate kind of LIDAR driven uh, approach. Um, We've got soil moisture, soil moisture with AquaSpy coming up as well, where they'll um, we'll bring in their CTO and he'll talk about uh, their approach. Um, and then we've got some on-demand archive that I mentioned as well, where uh, from Agrinet, uh, Centec, we had the CTO of Centec um, a few weeks ago share his perspectives on soil moisture uh, driven approach. Really interesting webinar if you haven't had a chance to look at that. And then Davis Instruments spoke last week um, on their year. Um, we are also interested or leaning towards setting up ag tech meetups um, on a monthly basis where we bring together ag tech companies, uh, agronomy advisors, um, researchers, uh, and growers. And it's really more informal. We'll do it the th last Thursday of every month. Um, stay tuned for an invite on that. We'll mention it in an upcoming newsletter. Um, and just thought it would be really good to bring like minds together in, in a more informal setting. And then there's a number of different blog posts that you see on there. One of those, we're increasingly um, investing in partnerships around providing connectivity in areas where there isn't a whole lot of connectivity, which some of you may have that challenge. Um, we found that um, while you may have connectivity on the outside of an orchard or vineyard, once you get into it, aye, it can be really challenging. And why is that important? Well, what we hear from growers is you want to be able to look at your mobile device and be able to actually understand what things are going without having to go all the way to the edge of the orchard or maybe even a mile or so down the road to look at connectivity. So part of our, our smart orchard approach for this coming year to do more experimentation around technologies like LoRaWAN, like private LTE, um, so that you, you can have connectivity in places that perhaps the carriers don't even have uh, any connectivity. So that's more or less a wrap. We're actually gonna open it up for Q&A. Uh, again, I wanna say a huge thank you to, to Colin Campbell and Dave Brown uh, from WSU, and again, to the Tree Fruit Research Commission for all of their partnership on the Smart Orchard. Um, you're also welcome to schedule a call. Go to www.innovate.ag um, and you can schedule a call uh, either through there's online chat in there um, or an opportunity on Tuesday afternoons. We basically uh, open it up for doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, sessions with growers 
and we'd love to engage with you there. So I'm gonna pause and see what we have for Q&A. Um, and it looks like we've got a couple of questions. First, uh, from Stefano. Um, what pest and disease models does Innovate Ag use and or provide to the users? I'm actually going to defer that, um, if I may, to, and maybe Dave already answered that. Stefano looks like it, um, you tie in with some of the models that, um, that WSU is providing today um, and it's tied into Ag WeatherNet. So Dave, do you want to speak to that? Right now? We, we don't, we provide cherry, I mean, pest and disease right now would be cherry, powdery mildew. I'd have to look on our website. So, so right now, for those who aren't aware, I think most on here probably be aware of it. We have like two different systems at WSU. So there's a DAS system, which has tons of uh, uh, tree fruit models, particularly apple models. Um, the cherry models in the past have been, um, uh, um, on, on Ag WeatherNet and the great models on Ag WeatherNet. So it's it's kind of split up, um, but I, the DAS people are on here. So maybe they're thinking about also being involved. <laughs> I love it. Um, and we do also, I mean, we're tying in powdery mildew. We can pull in powdery mildew, coddling moth um, for yep. blueberries. We've got a couple of different models that we can pull in um, as well. Uh, Thanks, Dave. Dave Crowder had a question um, on for non-perennial crops like potato, uh, where the canopy is growing constantly, where do you position a meter station? So here you go, Colin, to get consistent measurements. And so as the canopy grows, does the validity of the measurements change? Okay, so, so we're talking about canopies in, in a, uh, where we're where we're cleaning up the crop every year. I so I'm not going to say I, I'm the world expert on this. We position our our uh, Atmos 41s at two meters above uh, above ground surface height. That's kind of a, a a standard out there. You could also go to three meters, but more typically it's two meters. So all that we've done, it's always placed at two meters. Now something like a a potato, you know, an onion, a lot of those things are going to be great right there. But obviously, if you're in corn, uh, eventually, especially, you know, with some maize crops, it's going to be underneath the canopy and you're going to have to adjust that. So, so all the work that we've done, we have a fixed height in everything that we do of two meters. And, and I kind of defer to Dave. I, I do a lot of, you know, I do a lot of research yeah. out there on my own. But Dave, what's your experience? Well, I, so um, for for non perennial crops, we're not recommending generally that people put a station inside the field, um, just because of the logistics of all you know. You have equipment that goes through and everything else. Um, uh, really, is going to make that difficult, and and more than likely, it's going to be damaged at some point. And even even for grapes, we're recommending that that for the most part they stay out of the vineyard, um, on the edge, sort of a, some find hopefully have a little grassy area. On the edge of the vineyard, uh, because uh, you know, mechanical. If they're coming through mechanical equipment, they can easily damage it. But I do know that that our Idaho collaborators have Atmos 14s inside vineyards in the canopies, getting in canopy conditions, and they put just tons of flagging and everything. And so far, only a few of them have been destroyed. So uh, <laughs> that's that's <laughs> the practical matter is pretty important. <laughs> no, it is, and and that's. <laughs> You know, for for all the soil moisture measurements, we I mean, we're we're co-locating these with soil moisture measurements. So these are, you know, the grower is aware that they're out there since he paid for them. He's pretty careful with, you know, getting around them. We haven't. We've been doing this for about three years. This last year, we did nine fields. Um, so so, but it is a big concern if you have if you're working in kind of a corporate environment where no one's kind of where you're sticking them out and somebody else is managing the field um it's it, it's a concern so you don't you don't this equipment is is not free so having the the spray boom mm -hmm. take a system out is not that awesome yeah um we had another question on um one um that that 
has been partly answered by Colin is whether the equipment will integrate into SCADA. And so to Colin's point is um, Meter Group um, doesn't integrate, integrate in with SCADA. However, um, Innovate does have um, in our partner ecosystem folks that do do that, including kind of tying into PLCs. And so if you would like more in info on that, um, certainly do reach out. I think it was Jack that had that question. Uh, great question. Luke had a question on what weather system we would need to connect to for DAS. Dave, you knew this was coming. Uh, I was hoping I wouldn't. Um, we, we're having ongoing conversations and the DAS people are, are on this. So yeah, hopefully they see that people are interested. <laughs> Ideal, ideally, our system would feed into the DAS system and they would, you know, uh, be willing and able to take our data into their system. Uh, obviously, you, you know, they have their subscription base, but, but uh, still be able to do that. Hey, Steve, one yeah. thing I, we, I failed to, to actually address that as the canopy grows, does the valid validity of the measurement change? I didn't actually talk about that. Um, you know, as, as the surface changes, it certainly changes the, the microenvironment around the, the, the systems. I would say for an Atmos 41, Atmos 14, this isn't a big concern. If we were actually trying to, to make ET measurements using a, an anti-covariant system, some, some high dollar systems that, you know, we, we do want to know canopy height and some other things, but usually, I mean, those, those are taken into account in, in many of the models that are, that are done. So I, I'm not, not concerned about that personally. I, I don't think it, it affects the validity of the, of the measurement. I, as Dave pointed out though, in Canopy, you know, with orchards, that that is an interesting story where we've got some evaporative cooling, some rate, you know, things going on that really make nighttime temperatures quite low. It wouldn't be the same, I think, for a potato crop. I don't know. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, I, I would agree. I don't, I don't. Conditions certainly will be inside a potato crop, but that's probably something where you'd you do the research where you had inside and out, you had instrumentation to measure it, you had the outside and, and then you had some sort of a model that compensated for those conditions and how, but my guess is most of the like pest models are developed using a station that's nearby anyway. I don't, they probably don't put sensors directly in the canopy. So that's probably already accounted for. Makes sense. Uh, but I don't know I, for sure. I, I would wanna add just one more thing. Um, back to one of Colin's earlier presentation is, in the Smart Orchard, we found out of all the different sensors that we had out, out there, and still have out there actually that are emitting, um, I would put meter group top of the stack when it comes to high reliability, no RMA. I think Colin, you've mentioned your RMA rate is really low, is it not? Right. Um, yes. Yeah. There's yeah. Sub, value sub on half a percent. Less, I love it. Um, and, and so that's definitely what we've seen. And so the value in, in not having to go out and address uh, something, whether it's um, low power or just an outage. Uh, we also found that the ZL6 is a logger um, and connectivity uh, hub, if you will, really reliable. Again, one of the more reliable um, kind of across the board. We're, we've been really impressed with it. So you know, huge kudos to Meter Group. Uh, you may pay a little bit more, but frankly, when you look at ROI, um, you, you're not going to have, you're going to save yourself a little bit more headache um, or a lot potentially in that you, you'll be hands off. So I think that's a wrap. I'm not seeing any other, actually, I take it back. Two more quick questions. Um, so ecosystem, um, Jack had a question is ecosystem is a water and sewer district and you're going to do a project with IDDEQ this year to establish hydraulic load measurements via sensors to manage reuse water applications. So the goal is to replace the most arcane method you can possibly imagine with a data-based system. Okay, so that's, I think probably more of a context and um, but so Jack, we'd love to chat with you more about this, um, and love that you're going from the arcane to going uh, data driven. So excellent work on that. Um, and then Dave, I think you had a question, or you may have misheard on Atmos 41. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a wrap. 
Um, great conversation. Um, Dave, Colin, anything that you would like to say in closing? That was a lot of fun to get together and thanks for the kind words about yeah. uh, Meter Group. Yep. And I, I wanna thank Steve for organizing this and organizing that, that Smart Orchard project. It's been a lot of fun working on that and it's a lot to digest, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, but in the end, I, the concept is great that we get a lot of different people collecting data and, and seeing how we bring it together. It is. And so if, if you have any um, kind of new leading edge sensors that you would be interested in, in having participate in, uh, in the Smart Orchard projects this next year, we'd love to hear your suggestions on that as well, particularly on soil. As an example, we've got plenty on weather and soil moisture, but soil nutrient, um, we would love to hear from you. So thank you very much, Colin and Dave, for making the time this afternoon. Um, learned a lot from you as always. And um, please do tune in next week again for our uh, focus around Green Atlas and ATV based imaging. It's a lot of fun, not just driving it, but actually looking at the data. Um, so do join us then too. Thank you again very much, everybody. All right. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Steve. Have a good night. See you guys. Thank you, Steve.